Welcome, everyone. Um, hopefully, you've well, if you're listening to this, you've made it across from the main session. Um, the uh, this session is going to be picking up on the thread of what uh, Sophie Thomas has really been talking about in terms of behavioral change and, and applying behavioral change principles and practices to the climate emergency. And first up is our very own Professor Jackie Andrade in the, the uh, Department of Psychology here, who's looking at behavioral change principles and their application to the climate emergency. So Jackie, please take it away. Thank you, Ian. So I'm going to be talking about some research that we've been doing on weight loss and draw some lessons and show you some initial data on their application to pro-environmental behaviours and how we can encourage more of them. So I'm going to start off with Susan Mickey's behaviour change wheel, just as a reminder of all the different areas that we could intervene with to help change people's behaviour. In particular, I'm interested in the green bit in the middle, which says that people's behaviour requires that they have the opportunity to do the behaviour, that they have the capability to do it, and they have the motivation to do it. And I would put to you that motivation is the most important of those, because if you're really motivated, then you can find ways of doing the behaviour. So to give you an example, um, let's think about sorry, let's think about active travel. So we can create opportunity by providing safe cycle routes, for instance. We can increase capability financially or through educating children to cycle safely, and we can increase motivation. Now, often people think of motivation as kind of the set of reasons that people have to do a particular behaviour. But in our research, we found that motivation is actually a fluctuating state. So if you're imagining cycling to work and it's going to be raining, then you may well feel less motivated to do that, even though you know it's something that you believe is a good thing to do, than if you imagine cycling to work and it being a lot of fun splashing through the puddles. So in our work, we're trying to shift people from thinking, oh, do I have to do it, to thinking, I want to do it, it's going to be fun. And, you know, weight loss is just as hard as making yourself cycle to work in the rain. So a lot of approaches focus on how do we get people to um, exert willpower to eat the apple instead of the donut. What we've been doing is finding ways to help people eat healthily because they really want to eat healthily, not because they feel they ought to do it in order to lose weight. So our approach is called functional imagery training. And it's based on our research showing that mental imagery is really at the heart of desire. So when you want to eat that donut, part of that wanting is that you're imagining what it will taste like and how good you'll feel after you've eaten it. What we do in functional imagery training is try and create those desires for the goals people really want to achieve. And we do this through a conversation that is about the person's own ideas and the own reason, their own reasons for wanting to achieve them. We use mental imagery throughout and we train people to do this by themselves. The thing we don't do that is really unique about functional imagery training is we don't give people advice. We don't tell them what to eat or how much they should exercise. So why imagery? We know that imagery is much more emotional than merely thinking or talking. So if you imagine having a fantastic time with friends that you haven't seen for a long time, you're going to feel more of that pleasure and joy at being with them than if you merely talk about seeing them or think about seeing them in a more verbal way. But we also know that imagery makes things more concrete. It can make the future feel more achievable. It can make you feel more confident that you can achieve it. And it helps people to turn their good intentions into behaviours. And our own research has shown that imagery is associated with kind of a particular type of emotion, which is desire. So Imagery is associated with craving for drugs and for foods, and is associated with desires to do healthy things like reduce alcohol consumption. 
So we bring these ideas together in functional imagery training. We talk about the importance of the goal to the person, ask them to imagine how it will feel to achieve it, and that increases their desire for the goal. We elicit their ideas for how they could start working towards the goal and get them to imagine carrying out those steps so they get some practice in their imagination before they do it in real life. We get them to imagine how good it will feel to be taking those steps. So it's not that dieting or exercising is a sort of painful necessity to achieve your weight loss goal. It's that it will feel good to be taking control or to be sleeping better because you're exercising. So we do that to increase people's desire to, for the path towards the goal. We get people to imagine past successes and imagine using their previously successful strategies to overcome any obstacles. And then we train them to do this for themselves so that they are able to keep themselves motivated when they return to real life outside the session. So big question, does FIT work? I'm going to tell you about a study carried out by my PhD student, Linda Solbrig, where we randomised people who wanted to lose weight to either receive FIT or to receive a control condition that was the same structured conversation over the same time period, but without the imagery and training. People had no more than four hours of contact time over the whole of the trial. So this is very, very little compared with, say, an hour of Weight Watchers every week. We studied them over that first six months, and then we left them for six months. And at the end of that, we asked them to come in and be weighed again. And what we found was this, that in the control condition, just the structured conversations, participants lost just under a kilogram of weight and the good news was that they didn't put on any weight once the intervention stopped and this is important because typically in weight loss trials people lose weight and then they put on about 50 percent of the weight that they've lost what we were really excited about was that in the fit condition people lost around four kilos in the first six months and then instead of putting it on again they continued losing weight even when we were giving them no support and no intervention. So this finding really supported our approach of teaching people the mental skills they need to stay motivated. And remember, we didn't give them any weight loss advice. So this approach is based on scientific research on desire and imagery. It focuses on getting people to imagine the personal benefits of changing, the things that really matter to them. And it works. So less than four hours of treatment gave us weight loss of over six kilos in 12 months, which is roughly equivalent to what has been found in a study where people attended Weight Watchers weekly over a 12-month period. So if you're a participant, FIT is much less onerous and it gives you the skills to do this by yourself much sooner. And one of the important things that's really important for climate change work is that people reported that it changed their mindset, that they enjoyed the path towards their goal. And it wasn't a matter of having to exert willpower to do something unpleasant in order to achieve their, their end goal. And a nice example is from a young man who took part in the trial. He was rather lonely and homesick while he was a student and associated comfort eating with being at home and sort of comforting himself. He started going to the gym. He didn't tell anybody that he was doing the trial. And he said that after a while, he didn't want to eat the wrong thing because it would be undoing the good work that he'd done at the gym. And he referred to it as the food had stopped tempting him. It wasn't an effort to resist it, but rather with this new mindset, that sort of junk food was, was a threat to his newfound self that he liked much better than his old self. So could this approach help with increasing pro-environmental behaviours? We've just completed a 
very small pilot study. Um, this with my students, Chloe Matthews and Kez Keo. We randomized participants to receive just 30 minutes of FIT in a brief booster session, or to receive information about climate change and environmental damage. And then we asked them to report on their motivation and environmental behaviors two weeks later. So it's a very small study, but the results were encouraging. So in the fit condition, people reported being more motivated than when they just received the inf information. We gave them a list of 22 behaviours that could help the environment and asked them if they were doing these less than usual, the same as usual, if they'd started doing them or if they were doing them more than usual. And what we found was that for 15 of them, there was no difference between the groups. But for seven of them in this list, the fit group were more likely to do the behavior or to start doing the behavior. So that gives us some initial results supporting our approach of encouraging people to imagine what will per be personally good for them about changing their behavior. So the lessons for saving the planet are to encourage imagery because it's more emotive than words and to make this imagery personal so not something that's sort of quite abstract and distant and untangible so you know there's if i see an image of a, a polar bear on a melting ice flow there's gap between that image and things i can personally do is huge we want to make this imagery much more immediate. So much more about things that are local to me and much more personal and also pleasurable, not the threat, but the promise of a greener, more sustainable world. So these two photos show me the route that I can either walk or drive along um, to get to the train station to travel to work. Um, on the left is the view that I see if I'm driving. It's pretty dull. You see this very faint white line is what the council calls a cycle route. However, if I walk, I get to see all the flowers in the verge, which are stunningly beautiful and you know filled with insects and butterflies and things. So walking is actually a much more interesting journey. So if I'm imagining the right hand view, I'm going to be more motivated to leave the house early enough to walk rather than have to drive or cycle. And I would argue that these young people have got this absolutely right, maybe intuitively, but they understand this mindset shift. So I bet any of them could give you good reasons for why they're striking. They want to get government's attention to you know, influence politicians to protect their future. But in terms of what motivates them to get up out of bed and travel to a climate strike, it's a day off school and a chance to spend that day shouting with other young people who might become your friends who are as passionate as you are about future and about the environment. That's the way we can use psychology to change people's behaviour. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, there's a few, well, there's a long discussion, a few questions come in, but we'll take the questions after our next speaker and we'll put them together. But, um, so if I can ask our next speaker, Lee Cooper, to, to come on. Lee, Lee uh, leads on a nudge job, and he's going to be looking at applying behavioral sciences to real world problems. And uh, thank you, Lee, Johnny. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session. And my name's uh, Lee Cooper from nudge up. And I'm actually here to talk to you about very similar things that um, Professor Jackie Andrade uh, talked about. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to talk to you today about applying the learning from my own healthy eating nudge projects uh, to the climate emergency. But first I thought I'd give you a bit of background about who I am and what I do. Um, basically about five, six years ago now, I started uh, Nudge Up. And I started it really because I wanted to use all the knowledge I had of behavior, behavioral science, behavior change and nudges um, to try and help people. I know it sounds a bit uh, cliched by saying that, but it's generally why I did it. And also to help other organizations and charities to inject uh, behavior change into their projects. So, yeah, as I said, I've worked a lot with charities, different types of local communities, and social enterprises, 
and even some private and, and public organizations. And my work uh, stretches from looking at healthy eating behaviors, looking at uh, positive relationships and how we can encourage them, all the way to how we can create a better work environment for work efficiency. So what I'm gonna chat about today, I'm gonna to give you a brief overview of your nudges for those of you that aren't too familiar with it. I'm gonna to talk to you about the healthy eating nudges and uh, how they could apply to uh, the climate emergency and the techniques that will be translated to climate friendly nudge projects. So first, what is a nudge? Now, some of you guys might be thinking, well, you know, a nudge is when you prod someone. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, but it's, it's a basically, it's a behavior change tool that's sort of from, uh, founded in uh, behavior science and psychology. And it's been it's used uh, primarily to encourage people to make positive decisions. Um, a nudge upholds the freedom of choice. So people always have the set of options to choose from. Uh, all it tries to do is it tries to nudge them and persuade them to pick a preferred option. Um, nudges can look like anything, really. They can, uh, they mostly are the simple adjustments in the decision setting of the individual making a choice. And I'll give you an example of what that is now, because it, it's really hard to picture what that is once, just, once you've just been given the definition. So healthy eating nudges uh, are basically just nudges that attempt to encourage someone to pick a healthier food option over unhealthy ones. So it was like uh, uh, Jackie said in the previous uh, uh, presentation, apples over donuts. Here I have apples over chocolate. So we, a, nudge would, a healthy eating nudge would be, can we get them to pick an apple over a chocolate bar? And here's a very uh, quick example of uh, one I really like to tell people when they, just to help them picture what a nudge could be, look, look like in the wild. Um, it could be simply moving uh, an apple from a lower level shelf in the supermarket to a higher level shelf uh, in the supermarket. And what this does is it uh, immediately becomes into our, our cone of vision when we walk around the shop at our, our level. And they're more likely to pick it up and, uh, and select. And you guys might also be aware that supermarkets might try to do this with like sweets and chocolate and stick them up at high level as well, or promotional items to be more attracted to things that are really easy to see. So if we move the apple there, we have a healthy nudge. And I'm going to talk about some of the projects that I've worked on with healthy nudges. And I know this is all about the climate emergency, but these are basically case studies that we're going to take the learnings from and apply them to the climate emergency later. So it's just really simple some context. And I've worked on a number of projects really with healthy eating nudges uh, inside of cafes, restaurants, and, and corner shops and supermarkets, all looking to see if we can get customers to buy healthier foods over unhealthy ones. So going from left to right, we have uh, various cafe redesigns, what I call like nudgeifier cafe, where I go in, we work with a cafe in the local community to try and figure out what healthy foods we can call nudge and, uh, and how we can redesign the whole cafeteria in that. We also look at a menu design as well as so a food menu design, where things are placed, how things look to try and get people to buy more healthier uh, items over unhealthy ones. And the observable might be able to see that a lot of it is to do with jacket potatoes. And that's usually because when you go into a cafe, uh, jacket potatoes are usually the healthiest thing on the menu compared to things like the uh, a full English breakfast. And then going from sort of menu design and sort of chalkboard menu design, we have more creative things like green footprints that you see in supermarkets, but we use them to try and uh, guide people towards the healthy sections of the supermarkets where the, the fruits are located. So these are the type of things I've been working on. But, you know, so how does this all apply to the climate emergency? Well, if you think about it, when it comes to the climate emergency, the one key thing we want to do, and it's been said, I've heard it said in many other talks today as well, we need businesses and individuals to behave in more climate friendly ways. So we need behavior change at its core. And that's quite a big ask. And normally when I go about applying nudges to projects, I like to break that into smaller uh, sections. So it's, so we're easy, it's easy, more tangible and digestible, and we know what to target with our nudges. So for example, we have a few here. So one of these ways is to try and encourage people to eat a more plant based diet, use public transport more, increase recycling, conserve water, or get encourage businesses to replace old appliances with energy efficient ones like printers, old printers, and old light bulbs. So you can see these are the sort of areas we could target with nudges. But oh, okay, how healthy in climate emergency, you know, they're quite different areas. They have different variables going on uh, around them. But really, if you think about it, they're, they're really well linked because in both areas, you really want to encourage people to be acting differently, right? In the healthy eating side of things, we want people to be eating healthier foods and live in a healthier life. And in the climate emergency, 
We want people to believe in, uh, be leading a more sort of like climate friendly lifestyle. So we can use nudges and the techniques uh, from healthy eating and apply them to the climate emergency. So what I'm going to give you guys now is sort of like three ideas and techniques that I, uh, that I use to apply and design nudges to a healthy eating context. And I thought it'd be really good, especially if some of you guys are working on projects to try and change behavior, you could then take these away and try to apply them to your projects as well. So the first one is really simple, make it easy. So basically people will always, or more often, will always choose the path of least resistance, right? It's all sort of like the opposite of the saying, you know, pick the path uh, least traveled. Like people don't really pick that at all. They, they, they always pick the path most traveled. Um, so what you really want to do when you're looking at a climate emergency and you're trying to build a nudge into the behavior change project you're working on is you want to try and think, well, how can we reduce the hassle of performing this climate friendly behavior, right? So make the behavior frictionless, identify the barriers, remove every single one of them and just make it as simple as possible for someone to perform that behavior. So going back to some of my health eating projects that I've worked on, here we have on the right, we have, we've got this uh, big, uh, chalkboard menu designs and we labeled the jack of potatoes as Porky's favorite. Now, Porky's was the name of the cafe, so we didn't have much choice on that. But by labeling the jack of potatoes as the favorite, it automatically sets the jack of potatoes as the default choice. So as soon as someone works in, walks into the cafe, they see the jack of potatoes are the favorite of the cafe. It immediately helps them make a decision if they get stuck with all the things on the list. Well, I'll just go for the jack of potato because that's the favorite. You can see there we've already tried to reduce the hassle of performing that behavior and re remove the barriers and make it as frictionless as possible. So how can we apply this then to climate emergency? Well, let's just start with a hypothetical situation then to make it a bit easier for us. Let's say you are a manager of an office and you've been tasked with uh, increasing recycling rates in your office. How can we make that behavior easier and apply nudges around that context? Well, one thing could be simply just to move the recycling bins to a more convenient location. Maybe people aren't recycling as much in your office because, you know, it's not convenient enough to. It's a really far walk along the office to put stuff in the recycling bin, where it's easier to put it in your pocket and just take it home and throw it on the floor. One of the things could also be to maybe remove the need to split up the rubbish. So I know I probably speak for everyone here where it's always a bit of an effort to split up all your recycling into separate, into separate waste bins. So why not try and figure out a better creative solution so people, it's a lot less effort for people to just take their recycling and plop it into one place. Make it harder to throw recycling in the waste bin rather than the recycling bin. Maybe you can get a really large recycling bin and a really small waste bin. And then people are more inclined then to put their uh, waste in the recycling rather than the waste bin because it just seems easier for them to do that because the recycling bin is bigger. And another thing which I like uh, to call habit hijacking which can also help the behavior become easy. You can try and link the recycling uh, behavior to a habit that already exists. So for example, we go to the office space, one habit that everybody does when they work in an office is you know, when it's home time, they grab their keys, grab their coat, and they go to go out the door to get their car, right? So maybe you can come up with some sort of messaging that says, you know, whilst you're grabbing your keys and your coat to go home, remember to stop by the recycling bin. And you're basically piggybacking on another habit that everyone else always does. And that's another way to make it easy. So the second sort of idea and takeaway is to try and make your behavior appealing. So we are more likely to do something if it catches our attention and is fun, right? I mean, that goes without saying. If, if, the, if the behavior is boring or requires an awful lot of effort, we don't want to do it. So try to use stimuli in your project and, and nudges in your project that really stand out for the environment. This can include using salient colors like bright greens or yellows, uh, really nice, clear, crisp images and sounds. And also think about, you know, how can you make it fun for the person to engage in the behavior? Maybe you can offer some sort of incentives, some sort of rewards are highly effective as well. But remember, you have to try and maintain this appeal. You can't just keep it, uh, let, let, let put the nudge in place and then leave it. Because if you put up a post that's really nice and, and really uh, eye-catching, you've got a really uh, clever designer to make it, then the paper starts getting really tatty, or you design these nice bins and they start getting a bit all, uh, a bit all dirty and then you don't maintain it, people are gonna notice that and then it's gonna be less likely to engage in the behavior. So again, going back to the case study of uh, one of my projects, going back to the uh, chalkboard, 
uh, we actually got a local uh, artist in Plymouth to design this chalkboard. We came up with the designs, we talked to him and said, you know, we really want this amazing, tasty looking jack potato, because it was all about the appeal, right? And he uh, really, really nicely did this for us. And to me, that's really important. You have to give a sense in this project as well of taste, that the jack potatoes are tasty to get people to buy them. And then you've got to try and apply that knowledge to uh, your climate friendly behavior as well. So going back to our, um, our theoretical example of the increase in recycling rates in an office, how can we make them more, more appealing? Well, maybe design the recycling station more eye catching and pleasant to look at. Make them really bright green and nice and, and make sure that they're always away from sort of like the waste bins as well, because waste bins can always look a bit dirty and, and tatty. Another way you could do it is just to basically turn them into a bit of a game, put a basketball hoop over the top of them so it's more interactive as well. Create a reward scheme for the person or team who recycles the most. If you recycle the most, you get a gift voucher, you get 10 minutes extra off at lunch, who knows? But you've got to kind of to come up with some sort of incentive for them to engage with it. Maybe you should frame the recycling message as well, because recycling, if you try to talk to someone about it, it, it usually requires quite a lot of effort. Some people can find it a little bit boring. So maybe reframe it in a way that's more personal to them by saying, you know what, if you recycle, you'll get a really good boost that you didn't mean to move because you'll feel like you've done something good today. So maybe you try to reframe it as well to make it more appealing. And this was a bit of a contentious issue, but like maybe to try and send reminders to people, like, okay, do you know what? It's, it's 12 o'clock, it's recycling time. You should go recycle, things like that. But you've got to be careful about this because you obviously don't want to overwhelm them with, uh, with notifications, reminders, because it could easily lead to like a tilting point where they don't even want to know. Okay. The third and final sort of takeaway is make it social. So when confronted with a series of options, we often look to others for cues about how to behave, right? And we know this uh, from looking at evolution psychology, that we are very social learners. We're very observational. When we, when we struggle to find what we need to do in this, in this environment, we often look to, uh, to others to say, okay, how shall I behave here? We've all kind of been there when we've gone into a strange environment, like into a, into a restaurant we've never been in before, where the food is all sort of splayed out and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then you kind of look for all the other customers and say, ah, okay, that's what we do. And so by using this, you can then create nudges to help in increase climate friendly behaviors. So one way is to try and describe what most people in that particular situation are doing. So I've got a really nice shot here on the right hand side. This is from change.org, a petition signing website. So as soon as you go on the website and you look at a petition, it actually has this uh, little caption up here, which tells you, in this case, over 500,000 people have signed this petition. So it encourages you then, so, oh look, all these people have done this, they sort of like follow the crowd, they think, oh well, okay, they must know what's right, I'm gonna follow them and also sign this petition as well. Another important thing is think about who the messengers should be. For someone of a higher authority who's respected and liked, are more, uh, people are more likely to listen to them than someone that nobody has any connection with at all. So if you're working uh, on a project, think about, okay, what person can we get to give out this message? Okay, now let's go back to our recycling one to uh, make it more relevant. You know, we're in our office, we need to try and increase recycling weight rates. We're gonna come up with a nudge that is to do with social. So how we make it more social? Well, why don't we create a recycling champion in our office? Get someone who's really keen about recycling, Call them the recycling champion. By doing this as well, they become the messenger and the spokesperson for the project. And if they're especially a, a well-respected and liked person in the office, the effect will then snowball around them. You'll see it leaking out to all the different parts of the office as well. Just create a recycling team, and this can help with a peer-led approach. You create a team that's really enthusiastic about recycling. They can hold meetings, workshops, whatever you can think of. And then eventually, people then see that as this is what we need to be done. These are the people that are acting this way. We need to follow them and join the team and then slowly that will also snowball as well. Think about social norms. Um, so you could frame the messaging for recycling in a way that tells the individuals, this is what our company believes in and this is what our company does. So maybe you put up posters around your office to say, in our company, we know the right thing to do is recycle. We, re we only recycle, things like that establish social norms for people and they when they walk into the office they say they see that they say okay i work in this company this is what i need to do now because this is the norm also by giving individuals information on their peer successful recycling habits so say if you work in an office and then you get an email as soon as you log on say ah oh, brenda has increased the recycling rates by 100 percent uh, last week look at that how great that immediately people can look ah that is great um 
we're going to follow that now so I can see that Brenda's doing this it's sort of like a peer-led influence there and you'll see then again that will have a really great encouraging effect on recycling rates so a quick sum up then of the three techniques I walk through uh, and sort of the takeaways is making the behavior easy as possible reducing the friction making it appealing make it fun make it eye-catching and make it social think about you know we're social beings make it so social as you can so I've got some more learnings I kind of want to give you that I, I wrote down was, was coming up this presentation. I didn't think they could fit in those other uh, three takeaways, but I really thought it was important for you guys to take these away. And these are sort of like learnings I've gained from working on uh, nudge projects over the years. And one of them is you can't always be scientific. And I struggle saying that because I come from, I, I've got a master's in psychological research, so I'm kind of like scientifically trained. But sometimes, especially when you're working in cafes or some small businesses, it's really hard to apply that rigorous controlled process to the wild, basically. So don't worry if you can't be too scientific, just try to do the best you can. And sometimes you have to try and work around the rules. So especially when you work in small cafes that are really embedded in local communities who, are, who don't want to change anyway, and you're there trying to tell them, oh yeah, look, we'll design your menus to be this way to get people to eat more jacket potatoes. Sometimes you're not going to win people over and you have to be a bit more creative when you're trying to come up with nudges or sort of behavior change projects when you're working in that environment. So if you think about a climate emergency, if you're working with businesses, social enterprise or charities, sometimes you might have to be a bit more creative depending on how they work, but that's okay. Try to collect any useful data as you can, right? Because I've worked with a few people and I've seen them do behavior change projects and they never collected any data on whether or not their project actually worked, right? And I was like, how oh, did it work? And they said, well, we don't know, we think it did. It's like, oh, why don't you, you know, count something or ask someone if it worked? And this could be any type of data. You can either count a num the number of pieces of paper in a recycling bin, put your nudge in place, then count the pieces of paper in a recycling bin afterwards. Or you can just simply, if you can't do that, because you're struggling around the restrictions, just ask people, how aware are you now of recycling? You know, after we put our nudge in place. So it's anything simple like that. Again, simple, simple is always better. So I often speak to people about trying to create nudges and the creative process behind that. And they get really carried away. They come up with this long list of a million nudges and really cool projects they can do, behavior change projects. And I always say, um, you know, reduce the amount of nudges you've got from like a, to 100 to like two to one and only use one nudge at a time. Because then once you put it in place, you know exactly which nudge has worked and you know how to then advance it straight away. And it doesn't become too complicated for the people you are trying to nudge when you only have one in place. So thank you very much. I know there's a lot of information to take in, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. And I'm going to see if I can bring on, someone bring on Jackie back onto the screen. Thank you. So um, thanks for both uh, keeping in time there. We'll get some time for questions. I thought I'd start with this one because I think it overlaps with both, really. It's, I'll set it to uh, Jackie Fawcett from Jonathan. And he's, he asks about how does the fit relate into kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? And particularly, the question is about can one's ability to imagine be hampered by food and shelter? In other words, by your socioeconomic situation. Does that get in the way? Is that a barrier to some of the things that you're talking about, which is kind of interesting? I think, yeah, I think um, sort of impoverished social and economic situations are. A barrier to all sorts of things um, so I don't think it's the ability to imagine that's so important as using your imagination or even just thinking in a different way so thinking in a way that is more emotional more motivating um, will give an edge to the things that you're focusing on you know your long-term goals rather than the immediate draw of the chocolate or the coffee or the cigarette or whatever um, could I could I also sort of add in because it relates to the socioeconomic deprivation that I noticed a few questions coming through about anxiety. I'm go on to that, please. I think, yeah, I think that's a really important point because people often underestimate until they start talking about it how anxiety provoking it is to stay in your regular habits. You know, you know you're drinking more than your doctor thinks you should but it makes day-to-day -day life easier. Or you know you shouldn't be eating the foods that you're eating, but when you've had a terrible day at work, you know, it's the only thing that makes you feel better. So once we start talking to people about those things, 
and sort of draw their attention to how nice it would feel not to have that anxiety. That's part of that shift in mindset. So I completely agree with people who were posting questions about, you know, it's really hard when you're trying to recycle this and not do this and so on. And you feel like all the weight is on you personally and it shouldn't be your responsibility. So, you know, that's where fit takes very personal approach. So maybe if you're feeling like that, you know, what would be a better solution? Not doing these things isn't going to remove the anxiety, but maybe joining a green group that will help you do the big thing, like write to your MP or something, that will give you that social support, remove the individual responsibility, and hopefully be fun as well. And so that would be the thing we'd get people to imagine. And if that's successful, that's probably going to have more impact than just trying to be kind of very assiduous with your recycling. Mm. And I wonder, Lee, just following on from that, you mentioned about you know, making things easier for, for people. And in a way, mm. it, to me, I wonder if that kind of went against a little bit what Sophie Thomas was saying earlier on about actually when things are too easy, you just push the problem further down the line because, for example, the, the recycling just becomes a bit of a mess. But I guess the aspect that's making people feel good about themselves. I mean, how, where do you see the kind of key barriers um, in there? Yeah, I think it also depends on the context of the situation as well. Like, you, you wouldn't want to come up with one solution and apply it to everything because um, it just wouldn't work. So one thing that is really easy and works really well for one organization or project won't work for others. And it might, as you said, turn out to be too easy. And then it might just get all work. People just won't engage with it then. So I think you have to be careful when you come up with, you know, my specific, like what I specific, my specific projects and nudges, you have to be like, okay, where can we just remove some of the barriers for them to engage with behavior and then just keep them there and then keep them engaged when they're constant. I guess a question to both of you, really. It, it, one of the criticisms of a lot of behavioral change aspects is that it puts the onus on the individual to change their behavior and it kind of like takes a responsibility off of other um you know organizations you know higher up the food chain that that can make it changes at scale what, what's your take on this can we can this get done at scale upwards into to corporations as well or does it have to just sit at the to the local level jackie maybe um, first first um so our approach has been very much an individual one but you know if individuals don't change, nobody else is going to. So I'd like to think of it as beyond what I need to do to protect the little bit of environment around me and what I can do as part of society to influence governments, you know, individual politicians, whatever. Mm. Um, but the other issue is that obviously it's expensive working one to one with individuals. So, you know, can we draw more general lessons? And I'd say one of those is about getting people to imagine the benefits to themselves of a greener future. You know, we're much more motivated by what we get out of it. And sometimes you're just thinking about how much hassle it will be and not about the benefits. So shifting that conversation. And I think there's a researcher called Stephen Shepard in British Columbia who's done a really nice job of um, showing people what will happen if there's you know global warming but showing them what will happen to their towns and villages rather than just what will happen in general across the planet. And so I think that's one of the lessons that you can take those individual approaches and you can scale them up, not in the same form, but you can take the lessons and scale those up. Yeah, his stuff's very cool. I remember Sabina working a lot with him as well. So, <laughs> and so Lee, kind of the same question, really. I mean, how would you scale things up? Because obviously the, the changes we need are going to have to be you know, move at pace yeah. and attitude. Yeah, it's difficult um, because, as I said previously, it, it, you can't, it, especially with behavior change and like nudges when you come up with uh, behavior change ideas, we're not one solution doesn't fit all, right? Like, especially when I've worked in cafes, like there'll be some things that work in some places and some things that work in others. But I still don't think, I still think that it is, it is incredibly important to look at smaller communities of people and not just immediately think, we need to scale this up huge because some of the cafes I've worked in, they'll have local customers that go there every single day and constantly order full English breakfast every single day, right? So if we can make a change there in that cafe and just nudge those people to eat a little bit healthier, then get the word out and get 
more cafes to sign up in, in those types of areas, we can make a change there in the grassroots level. And I think once you can prove that you can, you can get something working that is it, that you can then develop something more scalable that can put across to nationwide. Great, thanks. I think we should draw it to a close because we're going to go into the marketplace uh, sessions on the uh, on the half on the hour actually. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Jackie, for kind of taking us through this. And it's going to be fascinating. I know there's a lot of discussion. You probably see it, Jackie, on the on the fit scheme. A lot of interest in that, and it'll be fascinating to see how that develops over the next few years. So, but thank you, thank you both for uh, for uh, your presentations, and uh, I'll say goodbye to everyone else and see you on the other side. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I just want the reminders for people to look at the discussion boards um, to oh, yes. see the discussion once once we've gone. Thank you. Well done for uh, I should have done that myself. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye everyone.